What is your small town deep dark secret? Story 1. This is a sad one to me. There was an older couple here who ran a halfway house for troubled kids who recently gotten out of juvie. They fostered a few as well and they were loved in the community. Wonderful people. One of them had an older brother who was a gangbanger in the nearest big city. During a visit, he snuck his 15-year-old younger brother a handgun. Younger brother ended up holding up a local gas station and killed three people. One of them was my friend's cousin. The foster parents lost whatever credentials they needed to do what they did, and the kids went back into the system. And the giant house has been abandoned since around 2009. Story 2. Ours was a football coach and history teacher. When he was coaching, we almost won every game. When he wasn't, we lost most of them. So I had to assume that meant he was a great coach. I had him for two history classes, and even though his jokes were mean and inappropriate, we loved it, and we learned a lot. He had the highest test scores out of all the history teachers in our school. A little over a decade after I graduated, he went to jail for assaulting a 15-year-old girl. I wish I could feel justice was served, but we had several male teachers who regularly made inappropriate passes and gestures towards the female students, starting at age 11, like spanking us and making us sit while they gave us awkward massages. He was not one of those teachers. Story 3. A guy owned a bar across the street from his house where he lived with his wife, daughter, and granddaughter of five. He had a contractor working on the house, and Grandma, who took care of the child during the day, thought it would be no big deal leaving the child sleeping while she went quickly to the market. Next thing is the Grandpa sees the contractor running to his car and leaving the house. Curious, he went home to find out what happened, only to find his granddaughter crying with blood between her legs. After the grandmother came back, he left the child with her, went back to the bar, got his gun, and threw the keys to one of his regulars, asking him to close the bar because he had to kill somebody. When he arrived at the contractor's home, he wasn't there. He then spent the next two weeks surveying his home 24-7, until this guy probably thought the coast was clear, and returns home. Grandpa sees him, breaks the door, kills the guy in front of his parents, then leaves, going directly to the precincts where he surrenders his gun and makes a full confession detailing everything. He was tried for premeditated murder, prosecution had all the evidence, testimony from his friends and parents, even the sexual abuser's parents. The murder weapon, his confession, it was a close and shut case, they say. Well... The jury voted 7-0 not guilty. In Brazil, there's seven jurors and you only need a majority to convict, and not unanimous like the US. Story 4. About a decade ago, there was a crime spike here. It was really bad because one cartel tried to displace the other. And because we're a sleepy town across the border from the US, we're prime cartel real estate. However, when they weren't tearing each other up in the streets, they were abducting, interrogating, and killing and disposing of the bodies of their rivals. Until eventually, one cartel managed to keep the town. One thing that baffled the authorities was their stealth. They came out of nowhere, struck their target, and vanished into the night. That may be possible for a small unit or even a lone agent, but that's unheard of in a cartel. Federal investigations were made and no one was able to find the cartel's HQ. It had to be big because they had weapons, vehicles, metal shops, dorms, kitchens, and the corpse disposal equipment. They looked everywhere. Nearby ranches, warehouses, junkyards, nothing. Until they looked where no one thought to look. A few kilometers outside of here is a fully operational state prison that they were using as their headquarters. Everyone was in on it, from the inmates to the guards to the warden to the governor. People were executed there, dissolved in acid, and the drums were dumped into a river. Since then, the prison operation has been shut down, and the former governor is a wanted man by Interpol. 
Story 5. 15 years ago, the local district attorney called his longtime girlfriend and told her he was taking the day off from work and that he loved her. He parked his car in town and went for a stroll past the local shops. He hasn't been seen since. His car was found where he had parked it the next day and he left his cell phone in the car. But his keys and wallet were missing. Later that year, his laptop, sans its hard drive, was found under a bridge at a nearby river. The hard drive was eventually discovered by a local woman walking along the bank of the river, but it was too damaged to recover any data from. Interestingly, investigators discovered that someone had done a search on his home computer for how to wreck a hard drive. Did he jump from the local bridge? Did he encounter someone whom he prosecuted who did him harm? Or did he escape his life to start fresh? Story 6. Back in the 80s, a couple were driving a motorcycle when they were stopped by three men, who then assaulted the woman while forcing her husband to watch. Then they killed them both. The police caught them not long after, and the same night that they were caught, a mob of 30 people gathered in front of the police department, broke in, and told the sheriff, You guys did an excellent job. Now leave it to us. The mob broke the cell where the three men were and beat them up and attached them alive and to a car, dragged them about four miles into a park in the middle of the city, where they set them ablaze while everybody was clapping and cheering. Almost nobody speaks of it to this day, but... There's even video of it. Story 7. About 40% of my hometown was homeless. No one had jobs. No one could afford any kind of housing situation. Neighbors paid for heat where they could on houses people were squatting in and everyone invited everyone else over for dinner every night. We didn't know who was homeless. We just did it. We hired anyone and everyone for odd jobs. A lot of people just lived as they would when they were kids. Keep the fireplace going with the trees you chopped down. Gathered water by the well and traded farm and trapped for food. I went to school with a lot of homeless kids. We had, looking back, the most robust school breakfast program I've ever heard of. I thought it was normal for over a half the school to show up until I moved to the city. You just gave people the dignity they deserved. No one was shamed if they dropped out of grade 10. We all knew that if they needed the job, they should take it. Looking back, I realize how wild it was. Our town was so, so poor, and no one was treated any different by me and mine at least. Sure, there were some rich people, but they overwhelmingly went to the other school, and there were no panhandlers, no beggars, nothing like that. It was just told the busier we were coming over for dinner. Did I like them? No, I kind of think they were jerks, but never did I make them feel uncomfortable. And most just ate, had some tea, and left. And if that doesn't tickle your fancy, a whale washed up on shore a week or so ago, and all the guys in the local high school took turns, uh, playing with it. All of them. Story 8. The town I was raised in wasn't exactly small, but here's the one, quote, dark secret. I know. My hometown was where lots and lots of sports players had their mansions. And so, of course, their wives and children were out and about in the community a lot. Every single sports player's wife in the town was, slash is, heavily addicted to opioids. Every single one. Opioid addiction is obviously an epidemic all over the country, but among the rich wives in the town, it had a 100% infection rate, so to speak. I know because one of my friend's moms was the hairdresser for basically every single one of those wives. I was homeless my senior year of high school and one of the sports players' wives heard about me from her, and she gifted me an iPhone. That phone was pennies to her, but I wish I'd expressed my thanks more. Because that wife passed away of an overdose not long after. Sorry if that wasn't too much of a dark secret, but yeah. Story 9. I don't know if it's considered a dark secret, but in the county I lived in from ages 10 to 8, we had a soldier die under some extreme questionable circumstances. 
They said he was drunk or experiencing mental distress and raided a nursery, the plant kind. They claimed he was attacked by wasp and ran, so he called emergency services several times, and claimed that someone was chasing him and trying to kidnap him. In the last emergency call, he said everything was fine, suddenly, and just 15 minutes later, he was struck by a woman who stopped and called emergency services. He was ran over two more times and died. The autopsy showed no signs of bees or wasp stings. The connection to the nursery is due to the fact that it was just up the road from where he died. The place was ransacked, pizza eaten, money taken, but his wallet and phone were sitting on the counter undisturbed. However, the family was not okay with this explanation, especially because, well, he had previously texted that there were some problems with the local boys, since the soldier wasn't from this part of the state. So, the family had a private investigator look into it. They analyzed the emergency recordings and found several instances of other people talking in the background. Though most of it couldn't be made out, except for one. And the emergency call where he told the operator that everything was fine. A male voice could be heard saying, Tell her. And the nursery. There was no DNA, no fingerprints, no footprints that led back to the soldier. Even though his phone and wallet were right there in the building. A lot of people, his family included, think he was killed by some of the local guys there after they got into a fight about something. They chased him caught him, and he was able to run again after the final emergency call. And that's when he was hit by a driver while trying to get help. And the police in the county covered the entire thing up because the boys involved were connected to the department somehow. Of the three drivers, none were charged for hitting and running over him. I think only the first driver stopped, but it was discovered that one of the drivers was connected to the department, either through family or friendship, so yeah, it's a crazy story, but you can look it up. Just search Austin Mago. I wouldn't be too surprised since there's a lot of shady stuff happening in small town police departments, including covering ups of everything that officers commit. I really hope his family gets some justice. Story 10. A freshman with Asperger's was being abused by his family at home. He was a problem child and got in trouble on purpose, but no one went hard on him because of his home life. He was a well-loved kid at school and in the community, and one day, just before holiday break in December, he was really sick, but his mom sent him to school anyways. Locked him out of the house, and he decided to try and get into one of those empty houses down the street through the chimney. Now, this kid was the size of a second grader, but he was too big to fit through since the chimney tapers down thinner. Mom never answered her phone when the school reported him missing. And, well, she went a whole day before she reported her kid missing. No one knew what happened to him. It took about a month and a half before we knew what happened. We all thought he ran away and was alive somewhere, maybe went to his sister's house, but nope. Dead in a chimney. The school organized an entire week of counseling and such, and they wore pink for a day and, well, even handed out pink. Everyone was in pink, pink ribbons, pink roses. Pink was his favorite color. Everyone was hit really hard by it, and that's how our small town started 2020. It hasn't gotten much better, as you can see, so weird that it's almost been a year now. Story 11. A guy I went to high school with threw a trailer hitch at an indigenous woman and yelled, Got one, when he did. She suffered terrible injuries and was in the hospital for months before eventually dying. She had some other health conditions that didn't make it easy for her to stay alive. He was being tried for aggravated assault at first, then they brought it up to second degree murder. It's been brought down to manslaughter because they didn't have enough evidence to charge him with murder. So, he pleads guilty to the manslaughter charge. My city is plagued with major prejudice out to the indigenous people. My family was the same way. I grew up thinking it was normal and said some terrible things. I realized I didn't even know why I had this hatred. 
I did a full 180 degrees on that <laughs> a while ago. This is how a lot of the town is, and the sad part is there are so many people in the city that are on this guy's side. Because she, quote, was going to die anyways, because they were just looking for hookers, or she was drunk. Basically anything to cover up what they really mean, because she's native. Crap like this is normal here. The police have labeled some death as accidental drownings, even though it's clear that they didn't just fall into the river. Someone I knew was picked up and almost thrown in themselves, if it wasn't for a stranger. Canada has a lot of issues like this already. The tragedies surrounding the indigenous people, but our city is one of the worst. Seeing people discarded like that makes me feel disgusted and guilty to have been proud to be Canadian.